good evening, and, and please do feel free at any point to wander over there. Um, we want to make sure that you stay healthy during this. I'm Nancy Lincoln Reynolds. I'm one of the pastors here at Woods Church, and um, we are delighted that you're here for this really important uh, topic on the spiritual development of our children. Um, the Woods Counseling and Care Center is the white building that's located down here on Cypress Creek Road. And um, we have been here for quite a while now. We have four therapists in there. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in doing is making sure that we're reaching out to um, parents and family and children in our community. And this is the first of several programs that we're going to be offering um, over this next year um, to do that. Uh, I'm going to, Holly, I'll let you introduce yourself. We've got our, our families and children and youth the people here, Holly Albrecht and um, Elizabeth Burrell, and uh, they are a part of the staff here at Woods Church involved with our family and children work. Our presenter tonight is Jim Walton. He's the founder and president of The Third Choice, which is a nonprofit organization that provides resources for believers and for those people who are questioning their faith. Um, he is a minister, he's a biblical scholar, an author, a teacher, uh, just a whole bunch of things, and um, has his master's degree in Christian ministries from Wheaton Graduate School. And he spent his entire career really working with children and youth and families. It's his passion, actually, to be able to do this kind of thing and to engage in dialogue with folks about spiritual matters and to really bring clarity to their understanding about God and the Bible um, and to bring people into relationship with Christ. And It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Oh, hi, boys and girls. It's so nice to see you all here today. We've come here to talk, and we've come here to learn, and we're going to have a good time today. I'm so glad you've decided to join me. And this way I get to wear slippers during my presentation. Of course, you know who I'm hearing. It's Fred Rogers, a well-loved Presbyterian minister who operated his uh, show out of Pittsburgh. And that's one style of, of child education. We have on the other side a different style of child education. There would be sunny day chasing the clouds away on my way to where the air is sweet. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to? That's right. And that's a completely different style of children's education. I remember, I maybe shouldn't say this, I remember when Sesame Street first came out and what sort of a radical approach to children's education it was because it was filled with so much technology and what we would call quick technical changes where they would just stay on a screen for a few seconds, move to another screen, move to another screen, and we'd say, how can children possibly deal with that kind of flow of visual images and technology? Of course, now we are decades later, and we see something like Sesame Street, we say, well, that's so slow for the kids. And then we go back to Fred Rogers and talk about slow for the kids, because Fred just kept the pace at very neighborhood kind of pace. And so what I want to say tonight, that it's quite obvious, now I'll pick this up and I can stop yelling. Um, what I wanted to say tonight is that it's not so much the strategy. You can see, just as Ecclesiastes 3 says, that there is a time and a purpose and a place for everything that's under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There is a time to marry and there is a time to give in marriage. And we know that there is a time for a nice, neighborly, slow-paced approach to children's education. And there is a place for that. And there is a time and a place 
for rapidness, for technical changes, for all the glitz and the colors of something like Sesame Street. And as we are talking tonight about spiritual nurture of our children, what's important for us to realize is that it's not so much that we all have to be cookie cutters of each other and that we all have to find one strategy. And I'm here tonight to tell you one strategy and you all better live by this strategy or your children are in trouble. That's not the way it works and that's not what I'm here to tell you. What I'm here to tell you is that there are basic principles by which we live. And if we honor those principles and live by those principles, then the education is going to work. Then the nurture is going to work, whether you are the Fred Rogers person, or whether you are the Sesame Street person, or whether you are the Teletubbies person, or whether you are the Daniel and Tiger, Daniel Tiger person. See, there's a place for all of those. And it's not like we say, this is the only one that works and nothing else works. What matters really is not so much the strategy or even personality. Because we can see that a Jim Henson personality is very different from a Fred Rogers personality. And so it's not necessarily just the personality that we're talking about. What we're talking about is the integrity of the process, the integrity of the person and the integrity of the process and the substance of it. And so if I say, say to you here at the beginning, I'll sum up the end of my talk at the beginning, just so you know where I'm heading, that when we're talking about the spiritual nurture of children, what really matters is spiritual integrity and substance. And I'm not here to lay out upon you a strategy to which you have to conform. I am not going to give you a list of, if you do these eight things, your child will end up fine. But if you skip one of them, your child is gonna be a mess. That's not at all what I'm here to do. We are talking about personality and we are talking about integrity. It is not, it is not a six DVD box set that you can purchase and be a winner. Now, I'll grant that you can get good ideas from a six DVD box set. I'll also grant that you can get some good ideas from Fred Rogers and from Sesame Street and from anywhere else because there are good ideas all over the place. But it's not a box set of DVDs. What it is, is Jesus every day. And I'll explain what I mean by that because we are talking about spiritual nurture of children, not just children's education. And so it's Jesus every day. Don't you wish, don't you just wish that kids knew automatically how to do everything right. Now, wouldn't that be a spectacular parenting present for you? You know, if, if you could rub that lamp on the genie, right, and say, one wish that my kids just automatically know what's right and what's to do. Bingo, there's a piece of gold, but it doesn't work that way. You know, like the Stepford Wives or whatever that movie where they built robotic, you know, spouses that would just do everything right. Would that be a great thing? Actually, it would not. It would not. That's not the way we're human. And if any of you saw the Stepford Wives movie, you know, there's nothing human about that, and that's not the way it works. But we sort of wish it was like the way wild animals, you know, when a, wild, when a, when a giraffe gives birth, that baby comes out ready to go. Somehow that baby knows how to run, that baby knows how to eat, that baby knows how to do what giraffes do. And all it is is the matter of the giraffe's life is that baby's getting bigger. Somehow, when the baby comes out, they know what to do. We all know that humanity is not at all like that. We have the longest learning curve of any organism. I'm, I'm pretty convinced. Even these tortoises that live for 200 years, they seem to come out of their little eggs on the beach and do, 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 do. they know what to do. Right? Our kids... We have the, you know, 18 years until we kick them out of the nest and for half of them to prove that that was too short of a time for them to be kicked out of the nest. They're only 18. Definition of adolescence, right? Children old enough to dress themselves if only they could remember where they last saw their clothes. <laughs> so sometimes you say things when your kids are teenagers, that don't really reach their ears until they're 40. That's just sometimes the way it is. 
And how do we handle spiritual growth in this climate? We all know what the world is like. We all know what's going on in our country. We all know how things are just churning, so it seems, all the time. And the culture seems to be dedicated against us, as if we who are spiritual are somehow the enemy. And it used to be that parents taught their kids how to be part of the culture. Nowadays, we feel like we as parents have to protect our children from the culture because of the way the culture is. The statistics we now see can be disconcerting. Now, some of them were on the promotional material that you saw. Some of them may be in your booklet there. I hope you all have a packet. Within 18 months, 18 months of leaving home for college, depending on what statistical survey you read, between 70 and 88 percent of our churched youth group kids have walked away from the faith. By the middle of their sophomore year, between 70 and 88 percent, depending on what survey you're reading, have deserted the faith. No business could ever have an attrition rate like that. Imagine if you owned a restaurant and 70 to 80 70 to 90 percent of the people who came into your place to eat once never came back. You'd be in trouble. You'd be in real trouble. Those are the statistics for us as a church. And then the statistics tell us that 30 percent of those who left never return. Never return. They're gone forever. Uh, that's the climate we live in now. While 3% of the American population self-identifies as atheists, a recent statistic came out, I saw it about a year ago, that 6 to 12% of our junior and senior high students self-identify as atheists. This is what's happening in the generation that's growing up. And they haven't even hit college yet, uh, where we lose 70 to 90% of them. So 3% of people in America self-identify as atheists. 6 to 12% of adolescents self-identify as atheists. There's a growth category that uh, statisticians use when they talk to people about religious things, and they say it's called the nuns. When they say to people, what is your religious affiliation? And they would say Presbyterian or Methodist. They would say Episcopalian or Catholic. They would say Muslim, whatever they would say. But there's a category now that's when you ask people, what is your religious affiliation? And they say, none. The growth of the nuns is the fastest growing demographic of America. And the growth of the nuns is now, at, by the last uh, research I saw, the growth of the nuns is now at 23.7%. Uh, 23, so that's close to a quarter of Americans. If you ask them what is their religious affiliation, now they say none. There has never been as many as 23.7% who identify as none. Um, our youth groups, you know, our youth groups are, are seeing, uh, Elizabeth, uh, yeah, thank you. You know, you, you'll see some of this in your youth group, I'm sure you do, and any of you who are involved in youth ministries. I was involved in youth ministry for 35 years. It was my vocational career, 35 years, that our youth groups are seeing uh, quantities of things that we didn't really see before and have to deal with before. In terms of teenagers who are self-cutters, who are cutting themselves, their arms, their legs, their stomachs. We're also seeing an increase in depression that is unprecedented in America. And I'm only telling you these things not to discourage you and say, okay, now let's close in prayer and we'll go home. You know, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to know what the picture is. This is the climate in which we are trying to raise our children and nurture them in spiritual things. This is the climate. And I also understand because I have family that lives here in Severna Park that there have been three suicides recently in Severna Park during this school year, um, in, the, in the high schools, right? Junior high, high school? Middle school. Yeah, it's just tragic. 
It's just tragic. What is going on with our teenagers? So many people self-identifying as nuns, atheism, kids walking away from the faith. One more. 95% of 20 to 29 year old who attended church regularly during their elementary and middle school years, only 55 continued to attend by the end of high school. 55%. 95% of them, of the 20 to 29 year olds who had attended during their elementary years, only 55% had attended by the end of high school. By the end of college, only 11% of those were still attending church. That's how great the loss is. And so what we're talking about now is, so how do we handle spiritual growth in this climate? Now I've set the stage. Welcome to America. This is, this is America that is unprecedented. We have never seen a spiritual climate like this in America before as far as we know. As far as when statistics were being kept and researchers were doing their jobs, we can no longer be casual about the discipleship and mentoring of our children. It used to be that we could say that Christianity was the foundational element in our culture and that, that America rested on the, the pillars of Christianity. And that even if people were not Christians, because you hear about the wild, wild west and you hear about the, you hear about everything that, you know, it was like back in the 1800s, you know, and you say, really, it's worse than that? Well, I'm not sure statistics were being kept by the statisticians then. But there was at least a Christian foundation to the culture where people would say, yeah, I, I know about the Bible. The Bible was just part of, part of town life. It was part of city life. It was part of America. It was part of education. But now it's not that way. Now we live in what could easily be called a very secular America. And there's still a lot of good things to say about America. I'm not disparaging America. I'm just saying it's not the religious and spiritual climate that it used to be. And the church has moved from a value-based to a value-based education rather than a biblically-based education. And what I mean by that, and I don't know, I have no idea what kind of curriculum you use here for your children, and so I'm not making a comment about any of your churches in particular. But there used to be curriculum where you would say, uh, you would study the book of Mark, or you would study uh, the theme of, of Jesus through the, through the uh, books of the Bible, or you would study a character like David. You know what I mean when I'm talking about biblical studies. But nowadays, they have values-based Christian education, which is where they are teaching you responsibility, honesty, integrity, and those are good things. But what's happening is that our children aren't really learning the Bible. They aren't really learning the revelation of God that was given to us and what this text really means. What they're learning is to be honest and responsible and full of integrity, and the Bible provides illustrations of that. But it's not really a, what I would call a Bible-based education. So when you take what's happening in our culture, and all those dire statistics that I gave you, and put that up against the church education structure that in many churches that I've looked at, they've changed their church education structure to now a values-based education rather than a biblically-based education. We are, we are seeing then that we're losing our students. We're losing our kids. And that's why I'm here tonight, to talk to you. How can we as parents be responsible in terms of what I said before, and I'll bring it back and any number of times this evening, spiritual integrity and substance to what we are doing as parents. The, the culture is decidedly secular now. Um, I run a website called The Third Choice, where I dialogue with other people all over the country and all over the world. What it is is a website where we just talk. Let's talk about spiritual things. Let's just talk. Talk, 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 talk. Back and forth as many times as people want. What I find is that out there in America, people don't know their Bibles very well. People don't really understand the Bible very well. 
They don't understand what it says. They don't understand what it means. And I'm thinking, we have to turn this around. We have to shake this up because this is, it, it's where if we're going to nurture our children in spiritual development, it all has to center around, go figure, spiritual development. It has to center around biblical education. Uh, parents and teachers now, uh, well, as teachers in particular, have to avoid any reference to Christianity in public in that, at least where I'm from in New York, oh my goodness, you know, talk about a, a decidedly secular education. You can't mention or bring in um, anything I, about Christianity. Yeah, I'm, I'm also a musician. I play in the schools. I accompany the choirs. We used to sing, if not, for instance, in December, we used to sing what's called Christmas songs. We also used to sing classical pieces, and because they were classical pieces, they were almost always religious. You know, we don't do that anymore. The schools are very different, at least where we are in New York, they are quite very secular. And so, we need to talk about, okay, how do we nurture our kids in spiritual development, what can we do? And as I said, it's not so much a particular strategy I'm gonna to talk to you about, but who you are. We have a mandate to nurture our children in spiritual things. The first place I'm gonna start off is Deuteronomy 6, verses six to nine. It's a passage, you're at least familiar with one of the verses in Deuteronomy 6, but um, I'll just read it to you quickly. The verse that you're familiar with, I'm sure, is this one. Deuteronomy 6, 4, that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You've heard that verse. You all have. Uh, but the verses after that are the ones that I'm talking about as to the mandate to train children in spiritual matters comes after that. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk along the road, talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so we're talking about this mandate to immerse. The word I would use there is immersion. Deuteronomy 6 talks about immersing your children. If you want to nurture them in spiritual growth. You need to immerse them in a Christian worldview, and you need to immerse them in a Christian paradigm as far as a way of thinking. Over in the New Testament, we see a similar, oh, I turned right to it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, and this is the part of the verse I want, bring them up in the training of and instruction of the Lord. So we are not only to immerse them, we not only have a mandate from Deuteronomy, from the Old Testament, but we also have a mandate from the writings of Paul, from Ephesians 6, 4, to nurture them in a scriptural worldview. And that's an immersive kind of experience as well. Again, it's not a particular strategy, it's our spiritual integrity and our substance. The Jews understand that very well. The Jewish people, it's always been part of Judaism for millennia that they have bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs because they have been training their children to prepare them for their special day when they are 12 years old so that they can have this celebration that they become part of the religious community. And the bar and bat mitzvahs that have been part of Judaism for millennia <coughs> And we see, in many cases, the strength of the Judaistic community. Isn't it astounding that in 586 BC, the armies of Babylon could come and smash the walls of Jerusalem, destroy the temple, slaughter the population, cart the exiles away from Babylon, and those kids kept being good Jewish kids. 
even though all that had happened. And you know what? Even without a priesthood, and without a temple, and without Jerusalem, guess what? Judaism just kept right on ticking. It, it barely missed a skip to beat. Because those children had been in, immersed in the Jewish worldview. The same thing happened in the days of Jesus. When in 70 AD, there was a Jewish rebellion against Rome in about 66, and the Roman army came in and, and tore down Herod's Temple Mount and uh, destroyed the temple, and the people were again killed. Guess what? Judaism just kept on ticking. Judaism's been around since uh, 4,000 years ago. Guess what? It just keeps on ticking. We had even in our lifetimes, uh, some of our lifetimes, the uh, horrible atrocity of the Holocaust. Back in World War II, six million Jews killed. Guess what? Judaism just keeps on ticking because the children are immersed in it. It's spiritual integrity and substance. Christians understood that as well. It's not very long into church history and we find that there is a Christian education effort. The apostles traveled around and taught families and they ministered to families. And Christian education of children has long been a strategy of the Christian church. I'm going to take you to another text that talks about our mandate to train children, and that's in Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18 is where Jesus says, where Jesus was asked the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child and had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But then we have another watchword that I think I wrote in your notes, do no harm, where Jesus said, and whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Do no harm. Spiritual integrity and substance. We all know the verse, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, obviously, the Bible teaches us to infuse children with spiritual truth. The spiritual stability and integrity of the parents, I think this is a fill in the blank you have if you're taking notes, the spiritual stability and integrity of the parents is the most essential component of the spiritual development of children. Once again, it doesn't matter if you are Fred Rogers or Sesame Street. It doesn't matter if you are Teletubbies or Daniel Tiger. What matters is the spiritual stability and integrity of the parents. It's the most important, is the most essential component of the spiritual development of children. What I have laid out for you in your notes there, and I'm not going to go through them piece by piece. The reason I printed them out for you is so that you can take them home. You can read. So there's no sense in me standing here reading to you what you have on the paper in front of you. It would be nice to go through them, but we did get started a little bit late, and I want to honor your time. You're all busy people, and I want to get you home on time. And so I'm not going to go through these piece by piece. Well, what I have listed for you there is five different paradigms done by researchers of children and researchers of children education. And these are people like Piaget, uh, Eric Erickson, uh, B.F. Skinner, Lawrence Kohlberg, and James Fowler. Now, 
for people now for people who have uh, taken courses in education or have taken courses in Christian education we read books by these guys um, we study them we take tests on them don't we Elizabeth we have to know these guys inside out and backwards for those of you who entered other fields of vocation uh, you may not have heard of these people but in the educational field, these are the, 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 these are the famous five, you know? Uh, these are the, the, big, the big cheeses. And so what I want to, to talk to you about is that if we were to, we can look at these in parallel, or we can look at these in serial. In parallel means that we will set them up in columns. And we can look at Piaget in one column, we can look at Erickson in another column, we can look at Skinner and Fowler and uh, Kohlberg, and we can look at them and you'll see across the lines the similarities between them. Because it's really not necessarily whether you, whether you subscribe to Piaget's paradigm or whether you subscribe to Skinner's paradigm, they're both basically saying the same thing with different words. And if we were to look at them in serial, which is the way I have them listed for you, not in a chart, but in serial where we just go down the row and then we pick up paradigm number two and go down the row and pick up paradigm number three, you'd start to think by the time we got to the end, you'd say, did he cut and paste by the time we got to the end of this? And so I don't want to bore you by rolling through that, but what I do want to do is call your attention to some of the highlights of what's happening in these, in these paradigms. Uh, if we go just to paradigm one, where we're talking about Piaget's, he divides uh, childhood into various stages, where he sees distinctive changes that what's happened as a child grows up. And you can see in the newborn to age two, it says, of course, the child has no understanding of God. But when a child is ages zero to two, and I've tried to write this down for you so that you could take it home and process it when you get home, the stories and prayers that a toddler hears from parents can make all the difference in the world in terms of starting to raise up a child in the way they should go. The stories and prayers that a child hears between birth and the songs that we sing them. See, it's important to begin when they are born to start to immerse them in the Christian worldview. And that's really what we're talking about, is the immersion in the Christian worldview. So that we are instilling these truths in them, even in the songs that they sing. The little girl on your cover, uh, of the, the little redhead on your cover, right, that's uh, my granddaughter. That's uh, Rachel, my daughter's daughter. And uh, Rachel did this, and, and so did my, my other daughter, Rebecca, who's over here, that as soon as the kids are born, when it's, when it's bedtime, you're, you're singing spiritual songs. You're singing Christian songs to them. Kaya can probably sing more hymns than most people in this room because she's heard them so many times. Um, because she has been infused with that kind of input. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about is immersion and infusion. If you were to continue reading down paradigm one, you would see that, yes, prayer is vague to them, that first bullet point under ages two to seven. Prayer is vague to them, but the ritual is so meaningful. Oh, well, mommy, we forgot to pray. Well, Daddy, we can't eat yet. We, we didn't pray yet. You know, that ritual is so meaningful to them. And they are being immersed in the spiritual worldview. Their conscience begins to emerge, and they look at you as a model, as to what kind of model you are. And you may think, they're too young to know. Don't fall for that. They are picking up everything subconsciously. What we, learned in, what we learned in psychology class and has been confirmed so many times is that you are God to them. As the parent, the way they view you is often the perspective that they have that they will develop about God. In other words, if the parent is loving and caring and understanding, and again, it doesn't matter if you're Fred Rogers or Sesame Street. But if the parent is loving and caring and understanding, the child 
will perceive God as loving and caring and understanding. If the parent is inconsistent and harsh and judgmental and irregular in their discipline, the child will often have a perspective of God as being irrational and harsh and inconsistent, and I talk with these people all the time on my website, who have this view of God as being this cruel, nasty, unpredictable personality that they cannot trust and that they you know, certainly do not honor. Because we pick up these things from our children, uh, from our parents, uh, what our parents are like. And so we as parents, the burden on us is not a particular strategy of, well, if I do these eight bullet points, then I'd be the good parent. All it is is being a parent of spiritual integrity, where you are the person of trust, where you are the person of love and caring. And so, you know, if it's, if it's a matter of, you know, when you say to your child, let me be right back. And then if mommy doesn't come back, or if daddy says, I'd be glad to take you to the park today, and then he doesn't take you to the park today. I mean, we all have situations where we know sometimes plans get messed up. But more the question is as to, are you a person who's trustworthy? Are you a person who's consistent? Are you a person who follows through? Are you a person who loves even when loving a child can be difficult? And we all know that there are some days, no matter what kind of good kid you have, there are some days when it's very difficult to be a parent. But it's these things that, that mold the spiritual perspective of our children. And I am not at all saying we have to be perfect as parents, because none of us is. We all have our days, we all have our moments, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. But again, it's not a list of eight things. It's not a particular strategy. It's who you are over the long haul. It's what kind of person you are. And that's really the most important piece of what our children are like. If we go down a, a little bit down that list, I think I'm still in Piaget, ages one to three, autonomy versus shame and doubt where children start to have a life apart from a parent's presence. Like we said, you know, um, where am I, where am I? Pardon me? I'm an Erickson, okay. Second paradigm, Eric Erickson, ages one to three, autonomy versus shame and doubt. Thank you, Elizabeth. This is where the child starts to have a life away from the parents. This is where the kid becomes mobile, right? They learn to walk. And what, what we find is that children have emotional tanks. If we can say it that way, children have emotional tanks. And you'll see that uh, there used to be an old video game where uh, you, would, you would be out playing the game, but then you had to come back you had to come back to the base, sort of, and fill your bucket again. And then you could launch out again, and you could do what you were supposed to do in the video game. And children pretty much work the same way. And those of you who are parents will know exactly what I'm talking about, that when that toddler particularly is in a place that is unknown to them, you will see them, they'll sort of hug mommy's knee, but then they'll venture forth. But when their emotional tank gets a little threatened or they're a little um, insecure, what'll they come back? They'll come back to mommy's knee and refill their bucket until they feel secure enough again to launch out, right? And they're filling their emotional tank as they move out and forth. And of course, there's some kids, they leave mom and they're just gone. Like, what happened to them? That is a secure kid. They're not even thinking about mama's knee. But you see, but how we treat a child. Some parents, as you know, can get pretty clingy and not let 
their little child even explore it. They don't want a free range child, right? Um, but then other parents, like, don't come back to mommy, you know, you know, whatever. But see, all of this, all of this is part of the spiritual nurture. We think this is not part of spiritual nurture. It's, it's our relationship with our children, but it is part of our spiritual nurture because the way they perceive us is the way they're going to perceive God. And so what I want to tell you is that there are a hundred ways to do this right. I'm not giving you a list. It's not like we all have to be cookie cutters. What children need is consistency. What children need is trust. What children need is integrity. What children need is honesty. And it's who you are as a person. And even though we are very different personalities with very different parenting styles, that's a good thing. God created us to be diverse. And diversity is good. There is value and strength in diversity. I've seen in the course of my years, parents with radically different parenting styles. Some that hold their kids so close and you know try so hard to teach them to conform. Other parents who are so laissez-faire and just let them go. And, and other parents who are, who are almost uh, you know, very casual about the way they raise their children. And I keep thinking, oh, that kid's in trouble when they grow up. But you know what? They're fine. They're fine. They don't have to do it the way I did it. They don't have to do it the way you did it. You don't have to do it the way your neighbor did it or even the way your mama did it. We live in a different culture. You're a different personality. And so what they need is consistency. They need trust. They need love. They need responsibility. And I could make a long list, but I don't need to because you can see where I'm heading with this list. They just need a parent who has spiritual integrity and substance. And you immerse your child in that. You know, barriers are important. A parent sets up barriers for a child, not necessarily physically, but in terms of barriers, especially with adolescents, you know, where you say to your adolescent, here's what time you need to be home by, here are the various activities I don't want you participating in, we establish barriers. And it's important in the spiritual development of our children that parents have consistent barriers and that they enforce those barriers, right? And as we talk to children, we find out later that children say, you know what was really most helpful to me as a teenager, and I, and I can say this because not only do I have three former teenagers, they've renounced their adolescence and they've become adults, but I was also a youth pastor for 35 years, and people come back to me and say, you know, those rules you had, those barriers that you set up is what I needed at the time. We had, we had one girl, uh, teenager in our youth group, beautiful child, beautiful girl, talented, intelligent, and somehow she went way off the rails. I, we're not, still not sure why she went way off the rails, but she did, and we know teenagers do this sometimes. And her mom had to get a pins order against her, and man, she fought against mom, and she fought against mom, and it was just really rough going for a long time, and you probably all know some family like this. And that teenager fought tooth and nail against mom, but eventually, eventually, I will say, she came to her senses, and she was so grateful that mom held the line. And, you know, this is just... Like I, I keep telling you about, it's, it's important. It's important to character. Uh, the rituals that we have as religious people are going to church uh, as a regular habit, our prayer around mealtimes, um, a prayer at bedtimes, the songs that we sing, the rituals we have at holidays are greatly influential in our child's spiritual development. All of these things matter. And it's not that you have to do holidays a certain way but it's that you do them infused with our Christian worldview. So you see, the model, the modeling is more critical than the strategy. The person is more important than the details. That's what matters here, you know? If we pop down to paradigm number four, which is uh, stages of moral development, Lawrence Colbert, 
If you want to look at that in your sheets a little bit. You can see he's saying the same thing that Piaget did and that Erickson said, where he says, ages one through four, morals are the imitation of examples. Same thing that the others said. And then he says, the morals of examples between ages four and seven become internalized as one's own, enforced by how the parent disciplines, how they reward, and how, how they punish. And we're not even saying there's a right and a wrong way to do that. There are a hundred right ways to do it, according to your personality and your situation and the way you run your home and the personality of your child. But then age seven to 10, it says, you know, for a seven to 10 year old, morals are thought to be follow the rules. You know, a kid thinks he's a good kid if he knows how to follow the rules. You talk with any second grader to fifth grader, that's what life is about. I follow the rules. I do what my teacher says. I do what my mama says. And, and he's a good person then. He's a good boy or she's a good girl. And this taps back to, we didn't even go through it, but it taps back to things that Eric Erickson said. In his initiative versus guilt, we're not going to turn back there, but we're saying, if they feel loved by their parents, if they know they are loved by their parents, if they have stable friendships, if their parent has been a parent with spiritual integrity and substance. See, it is here where they learn to be legalistic or able to achieve higher stations of moral development. If the parent has been a person of spiritual integrity, then they will advance beyond the legalism they will advance beyond the rules and the hostility and the antagonism that that will bring later in life. Now the problem, if I can say so, that we are seeing in America right now is too many children. And we can't turn back the clock. But too many children never learn to get beyond that stage of following the rules, and being hostile to people who don't live the way I live. And we see that in our country. And, you know, it's, it's the way the parent acts. And as I said, you can read this all when you get home, and hopefully it'll make a whole lot more sense to you, rather than just academic gibberish, because it is here where they learn to become legalistic, we're able to achieve the higher stations of moral and spiritual development. Now there's a guy named James Fowler, if you just go down to paradigm number five, I'll quickly close off this session. There's a guy named James Fowler who specifically studied the stages of spiritual development. I did, uh, it's worth spending a little bit more time on this, where he talked specifically not about child educational development or moral development like Kohlberg did, but he talked about spiritual development. And he called the preschool age intuitive projective. The children, as we all know, they have this mix of fantasy and reality. And they hardly know, seem to know where one starts and the other stops. And they blend the two so simply. It's one of the magic times of childhood. We all love being with children whose imaginations are so fruitful and playful. And this is where basic ideas, now see even Fowler, Look what he's saying, the same things that the others had said. Basic ideas about God are picked up mostly from parents. Some from the environment, but mostly from parents. Then in grade school, the next bullet point, he calls mythic literal, where they accept the stories of faith as literal. They accept the teachings of people in authority over them. Well, grandpa said it, so it must be so. That's what my teacher said. So that's what the truth is. And of course, it should be that way. It'd be pretty tough to teach a kid that did not acknowledge that the authority over them had any authority over them. When you get to adolescence, it's a whole different picture. And uh, anybody, you know, Elizabeth, we all know about this, uh, those of us who are youth pastors, uh, synthetic conventional, it's the first attempt where they try to separate themselves between what mom and dad think and between what their teacher had told them and what they think. Their mind has finally entered what Piaget would, would, talk, would call a, a uh, formal operational kind of thinking 
where their brains change the way they act, and they're able to think differently than they used to, and that's where they first attempt to synthesize a spiritual worldview for themselves. And yes, they will challenge authority, and they will accept peer views, but here's where authentic conversations make the difference. And here's where all the building blocks that you built into them as a parent in the first 12 years of their life start coming to bear. Where they start, again, how far out are they going to emotionally, they still have the emotional tank, a toddler hangs on to mommy's knee. But a, an adolescent has a certain binding to home and to mom and dad. And they rebel against it, but they're not ready to go out on their own, and they know it, and they keep coming back. And they venture out a little further, and they come back. And they venture out a little further, and they come back hostily. And then they venture out a little further, and they come back lovingly. Welcome to adolescence, right? But it's really the same thing. There isn't a whole lot between a no, difference between a developmentally, between a two-year-old and a 13-year-old except the size of the, the frame they're in. Um, but in terms of what's going on in them psycho psychologically, it's very similar, and I could talk about that. Uh, that's another hour, I'm not gonna go into that. And what's happening during the uh, age 13, both in their brain physiologically and in, their, and in their brain as far as that is concerned. But this is where authentic conversations make the difference, where the parent just has to be honest with them. Don't play games, give them real answers, give them honest answers, be a person of spiritual integrity and substance. Because that's what a 13 year old needs. They may throw it in your face and walk away, but just like this girl that I had mentioned before, there's a time, I, I mentioned it in a joke earlier, sometimes the things you say to a 13 year old finally get through to the brain by the time they're 40. But it does happen that way. My daughter's not quite there, so I'm still waiting. <laughs> um, but see, I, I have in that last paragraph just before we take our break. A child cannot be kept spiritually neutral. It does not happen. Parents and other adult caretakers will help to determine by their actions and attitudes during the formative years if future spiritual growth and development will be healthy or unhealthy. Four basic ingredients. Genuine and consistent love. You wanted a list? This is the best list you, this is the only list you're gonna get from me, right? Genuine and consistent love. Whether it's Sesame Street or Fred Rogers, hardly matters. Realistic, consistent, and loving discipline. There's a hundred ways to do that, right? I'm not advocating a particular plan. A support system of dependable trust. And responsible input of theological, biblical information and socialization and religious habits where we are infusing them with the paradigm of a Christian worldview and immersing them in it. And if you do those four things, you're doing good. That's what, that's what is for you as a parent. Where you are, you are being the person that you should be and immersing them in the worldview that, that God has given us and that that's, that's where those spiritual things happen. Uh, we're going to take a 10 or 15 minute break here uh, to give you time to process this a little bit. Uh, on part two we're going to get a more listy and talk about specific things that you can do as a parent or as an adult in uh, someone's life, uh, whether you're a grandparent or whatever it is, that uh, are principles of practical spiritual development. So let's take a little bit of a break now.